This is prime time New York in the 1950s, the decade scarred by the World War II aftermath, one of the most prominent eras in the civil rights movement. But there's an almost unknown story from both the era and the place. The 16 year manhunt for the mad bum. The man who bombed multiple public places in the New York area. His reign of terror got so horrific, the authorities hired a team of psychiatrists to create what we call today a psychiatric profile. It was the first of its kind, which changed the way the world looks at criminal psychology forever. One of his most notable bombings began on March 29, 1951, when a homemade pipe bomb explodes at Grand Central Station in New York shortly after 5 p.m. In today's society, that incident would have been everywhere. I mean, literally everywhere. But the local news outlets at the time barely even acknowledged the situation, which is pretty mind-boggling in hindsight. The New York Times reported the event in the following day's issue with a three-page brief at the bottom of page 24. A few weeks later, workers of the co-ed New York Electric Company complained of a loud explosion in the lobby of their main office in the phone booth. The company spoke to authorities, and they completely downplayed the incident and gave no public attention because they didn't want to, quote, build up the ego of the net who did it. 13 days after that incident, the mailroom got a strange package that had a pipe bomb with caps on both ends. A high-ranking member in co-ed contacted the bomb squad and asked if they were willing to investigate the incident. The package was addressed to Edwin Jennings, the company's director. A short time after the findings, the bomb squad arrived suited for action and ready to examine the deadliness and structure of the bomb. The officers gently lifted it into a box that resembled a basket woven with thick steel cables, a container the bomb squad referred to as the envelope. They hung the envelope in the center of a long steel bar. They carried the package to an armed truck waiting outside. After returning the live bomb to the bomb squad laboratory, they safely disassembled and disabled the explosive. It was certainly made by the same craftsman, but was even more sweet was that the device contained sugar instead of gunpowder. So it's pretty much clear that this device was meant to be found and taken as a foul joke. But in this instance, the joke was on him because the police found their first clue on who this strange bummer could be. The envelope was a postmark from White Plains, New York. A return address from Lehman and Lehman. An address handwritten in all caps providing the police with a distinctive handwriting sample, one with some unusual letter forms, especially the letter G. Larger than the neighboring letters, the G resembled a capital C, pearls on the bars on both sides of the loop. There was a letter that arrived at the New York Herald Tribune on October 22, 1951. The letter was a commitment of creating a bomb at Coed. The letter was sent to the city's editor, and quite ordinary to most. The editor opened the letter, and there it was, a handwritten note in block letter type of writing. After the finding, the New York Herald Tribune contacted the authorities right away. The note indicated that a bomb would be detonated sooner than later, targeting a man's room at Paramount Theater in a phone booth in Pennsylvania Station. The bomb squad took action immediately to the theater, and what they found was that the note was entirely accurate. Investigators removed a small live bomb. Its construction would turn out to resemble those prior bombs. The officers at Penn Station, however, found nothing. About seven months after the first pipe bomb exploded at Grand Central Station Terminal, detectives made a surprising realization. 
the Grand Central device in March 1951 was not the first. In the device archives of New York City's police, they housed in a dusty box dating from before World War II. There was another note written by the same handwriting and the same strange blocky letters. The letter was signed by F.P., which is obviously even more of a mystery. What is even more crazier is that the authorities looked through their evidence archives and found two bombs very similar to the new bombs. One of these devices was found sitting on a windowsill outside of Coed building, 11 years before the Grand Central Station device was planted. About a year after the discovery of the first pipe bomb in 1941, a resident found another bomb in the street about five blocks away from the co-ed headquarters, stuffed inside a red sock in the street. This one did not include a note. Police recognized the construction and were aware of the proximity to co-ed, so they speculated that its owner had ditched it when they spotted law enforcement officers. Law enforcement also found a note from an older case that was received earlier in December 1941 and a letter was written like a random note with pieces of cut out magazine letters to write out the notes on the sheet of paper. And he actually kept his word and no more bombing attempts were made. So his past bombings eventually faded into darkness. But after a decade of pure silence, he eventually strikes again. His grudge between FP and Co-Ed seemed so odd. Co-Ed suggested that it had to be an unhappy customer or angered former employee. Both of these cases seemed convincingly more logical. So detectives gave Co-Ed a sample of his handwriting and told them to dig through the archives of their past and present employees or to find a match for FP. This task was highly difficult because this was a rather large company and have employed thousands and thousands of employees throughout different departments. 